My name is Malte Gatter. Um, I'm about to become a professor at the University of St. Andrews in the School of Physics and Astronomy, and my group is currently transiting from the Technical University Dresden in Germany to Scotland in St. Andrews. So my group is uh, interested generally in the um, properties of soft materials and their optical properties, and then vice versa in developing photonic devices that are based on soft materials. And our particular interest is in light-emitting soft materials, and there are different um, classes of interest. So one interesting example are the organic semiconductors. So organic semiconductors, these are molecules, um, hydrocarbon molecules that consist of these large um, delocalized electron systems. And they are capable of emitting light very efficiently. And at the same time, they have a few very interesting electronic properties. And we, um, we, we use them to make um, light emitting diodes to make LEDs that are based on these organic semiconductors. And, and, and really, at the moment, they are mostly considered um, as the active component in smartphone displays, but we believe that they will lend themselves to many other applications, including those in um, biomedical imaging and in sensing. And then another interesting example of a soft light-emitting material is actually one that nature has provided us with in a multi-million year evolution cycle. And this is the class of fluorescent proteins, where the so-called GFP is probably a particular famous example. Now, GFP is produced uh, by a jellyfish, the so-called Aquera victoria, and in this jellyfish, it helps the jellyfish to produce bioluminescence. Now, what's so interesting about GFP is that we can basically steal the software program um, that tells the jellyfish how to produce the GFP and introduce it into almost any other organism. And in this way, for example, we have been able to program a cell line, a human cell line, to produce GFP and then take individual of these cells and use them as the gain component in a micro laser. GFP is just one representative of a um, whole class of fluorescent proteins. There are fluorescent proteins that generate um, light of different wavelengths and we are hoping to introduce these into laser systems so that we can cover a larger spectral range. But there are also fluorescent proteins that can be, for example, switched on and off by an optical stimulus. Um, or there are proteins um, where the wavelength of emission can be changed by exposing the protein to a certain chemical cue. And by integrating such proteins into a laser system, we hope to become even more sensitive to these chemical cues and to speed up these measurements. So we imagine a protein-based um, biological sensor that would then allow us to very sensitively and very quickly measure the um, existence of certain chemical stimuli. Y using a fluorescent protein instead of a, um, artificial synthetic material, of course, has um, two other uh, very important advantages. I mean, first of all, and because it's a natural material, um, most organisms will just tolerate their, the, its presence. It's not toxic to most organisms. So that is important because it allows us to introduce the protein into a living organism. And then the other, maybe even far, more far-reaching um, implication of this is that we can program the organism to produce the protein and thereby eventually might arrive at a um, photonic device that can be produced just by inserting the blueprint in the form of the DNA and then the organism will do it for us and thus just produces the sensor that we then use to monitor what's going on in the organism. This is so, still something that's very much at the beginning of its development. So. Um, one of the downsides we experience currently in the lab is that not many people are using fluorescent proteins in, in optics. So not many people are requiring large quantities. So although you can in principle make these proteins in a bioreactor, for us it's sometimes hard to get by um, a large quantity of the material and it can be quite expensive. But I'm, I'm expecting that this is going to um, get better over time. And then one other thing, um, probably these biological materials, I mean they do have a certain sensitivity to very high intensities of light. So we can imagine that, um, at least in very high power laser applications, they will not be able to compete with um, these um, very, very stable inorganic crystals that actually perform very well in these, in these types of applications. One example for is um, at the moment that we are looking at um, protein pairs that decompose when um, there is a presence of an enzyme that signals to the cell that it's going to die. Um, so we might be very sensitive to, to, to um, finding um, the first um, cues of cell death very early on, even, even before the cell knows itself that it's, it's, 
going to die. There is extensive work on using fluorescent proteins um, just as an in vivo marker um, for micro microscopy. Um, the main difference to my work is that in, in, our, or in my work I'm using the fluorescent protein or the stimulated emission from the fluorescent protein. So it's a much more intense signal that we get and it's also more narrow in the emission spectrum. So, so we, we actually have the opportunity to get more information out than we would if we just used the spontaneous fluorescence from the protein. I'm obviously not the person who started the research on GFP and the other fluorescent proteins, but initially when this was investigated, they really catch the jellyfish, extracted the protein, and then it was very bad luck for the jellyfish. Um, since the time when people were first able to extract the DNA from the jellyfish that encodes for the protein, um, things have changed for the better for the jellyfish because this DNA can be easily replicated in, in a chemistry lab, a biochemical lab, and you then no longer have to actually get to one of these jellyfish. And to, to, to be honest, I've never worked with a jellyfish myself.